A Manifesto for Hope, Principle 2. Where there's ruin, there's hope. Many of our government-funded systems are failing the most vulnerable and disadvantaged. At the same time, we're sidelining our greatest national asset, local people. We have a stark choice. To keep pouring money into policies we know aren't working, or to invest in new and better ways that really improve people's lives. We need a radical reset, one that empowers local charities, grassroots movements and faith groups in a more imaginative, less bureaucratic, more collaborative approach to community development. I'm Steve Chalk. My book, A Manifesto for Hope, sets out 10 tried and tested practical principles for how to develop joined up, cost-effective, community empowering work, each gleaned from the hard-won experience that sat at the heart of my work over the last four decades. It culminates in a call for a new social covenant, one that will transform the life chances of countless young people and families. It's time to reimagine. It's time for a manifesto for hope. Principle two. Where there's ruin, there's hope. With my guest and expert witness, Hilary Cottam, social entrepreneur and author of Radical Help, how we can remake the relationships between us and revolutionise the welfare system. Hello, Steve. It's lovely to be here and I'm really looking forward to our conversation this uh, afternoon. Me too, Hilary. I've uh, read your book. Oh, thank you. Uh, several times. And I even got it on Audible so I can listen to it, uh, listen to it again, you know, and uh, remember bits of it because I thought the principles that you were articulating were just fantastic. You know, I'm a, I'm a fully paid up believer. Well, truly. thank you so much. I, thank you. I honestly am. And in actual fact, that's what I want to uh, talk to you about. So principle two in my book begins by me just saying that we all know that when COVID hit us, in 2020, it hit us in such a way that some people were devastated by it. You know, I said time and time again on the interviews that I did at the time, we're all in this same storm, this devastating storm, but we're not in the same boat. Yes. Some of us have got yachts. Some of us have got rowing boats. Some of us haven't got boats at all. We're just clinging to a bit of driftwood or left to drown. It, um and then we we re-emerged or we're re-emerging from COVID, but it still come, keeps coming back to get us a bit. And we're plunged into a second crisis, the cost of living crisis. And so what I say in my book is, you know, the wise learn. What can we learn from this unequal crisis of COVID and this unequal crisis we call the cost of living crisis to make us wiser about uh, the future? Mm. Um, I tell a story uh, in this chapter about a friend of mine who works for Oasis. And uh, they rang me just to tell me, as I was writing the book, about the summer club that they run in the community where they work. And uh, all of the summer activities that we provide uh, for children and are provided for children and their families. But there's this particular lad had got a hot dog. We always do meals with all our activities. This particular lad had got a hot dog and, he, and he'd eaten his hot dog and he came back and the Oasis staff member, she thought he was coming back to get another hot dog for himself. But he just said this. He said, um, please, he said, my little brother is hungry too. Can I take a hot dog home so that he can have one? And even as I tell you that story, yeah. again, you know, I, it makes you weep, doesn't it? it it's, it's extraordinary that that can be a kind of reality today in Britain, isn't it? Exactly. And yet it's widespread. I mean, amongst everywhere. so much abundance and, as you say, kind of like such inequality. So the, the, the inequality grows, doesn't it? The gap gets wider all of the time. So you have to ask, what did we learn from COVID. What have we learned from this thing that we've called the cost of living crisis? One of the things I'd say actually about the cost of living crisis is half the families that we work with, they've always been in a cost of living crisis. Mm -hmm. It's only that this particular cost of living crisis touched 
more middle class families who are articulate enough to call it something and then get some air time for it. Mm. But this is a crisis so many families live in. We always say, don't we, and I know you've written a lot about this, but my take on it is this. You constantly hear that the system is broken. What are we doing about the system? My take on it is the system's not broken. We just never had one. We've never had a system. In fact, I think that what I encounter in my work, you know, with um, uh, the community centres we run, we, we uh, also we run the first thing that Oasis ever did was develop housing, and we run housing projects, supported housing projects around the country. Then we develop uh, we we develop community centres, sports centres, all sorts of things. We run local libraries, public libraries, and all 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 sorts of things. And then we added into that schools, but we off we offer all sorts of services in communities. And what I'd say is this, we don't have a system. We have lots of systems and the systems don't talk to each other very well. If I'm being really honest, Hillary, running 54 schools, I can say we don't have an education system. Hmm. What we have is several bits that we kind of try to jam together and call a system. But to just take one simple one. We have, we run primary schools. And then you leave your primary school, year six, age 11, and six weeks later, you go into a secondary school system, which is completely different yeah. to the primary system, which is why so many children, Suffer. as I'm sure you yes, know, they never transition. Yeah. They never make it. Why? Because it's not a system. Mm. We have all sorts of systems, housing, and we have we have mental health and social services, et cetera, et cetera. And they measure different sets of data for different things and they don't talk to each other very well. And they're all kind of, they're, they're output focused. How many people have we shoved through our system and seen rather than outcomes uh, focused? Mm. What actually happened for this family, for these people, for this young person, for this older person? What actually went wrong? So... That's what I argue, mm. that there is no system. There's lots of smaller ones and they don't fit together. It's a bit like when I was a kid, I grew up in, uh, I grew up in uh, South Norwood in Croydon and um, my family, my mum and dad were extremely, extremely poor, never had a bank account, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We never, ever went away on a holiday. I'm not trying to complain about it. Actually, it was a brilliant childhood. And my mum... Uh, I've got brother and two sisters. She came up with this genius idea. My dad used to work on the railways at Norwood Junction Station. He was a ticket collector. So he used to get four sets of family tickets a year. So we used to go to Brighton four times in the summer, but for the day on the pier. <laughs> but all the rest of the time we'd be at home. So you, she used to go to the second hand shop in South, South Norwood. I can picture it now. And she'd buy a jigsaw puzzle. You know, one of those with a thousand pieces yeah. or something like that. But she'd always, I don't know if she did this purposely, actually. She'd always say, I've got this jigsaw puzzle, but it's second hand and um, I haven't got the picture. No. Yeah. <laughs> and so with my two sisters and my brother, through the summer, besides playing in the garden and stuff like that, we'd work on this giant jigsaw. And the funny thing is, when you've not got the overall picture... It's really hard yeah, to put anything imagine. together. It takes the whole six weeks. Yeah. But here's the amazing thing. On the day before we went back to school in September, miraculously, every year, she the could whole find the picture. thing needs to come together. So I suspect that she actually had the picture hidden somewhere. But I do think she got that from a secondhand shop because there was always... At the end, a few bits missing. And there were some bits of jigsaw that I struggled with. You know, you keep seeing a piece with red and green on and you think, where's that fit? And then I'd realise at the end it didn't fit anywhere. And I always think that's what our system's like. People fall through it. It's full of gaps because it's like bits of jigsaw from different pictures that never fitted together in, in, in the first place, really. I think that... I can speak about the systems I know best. I know the justice system. I know the education system. I know the housing system. I know the NHS uh, pretty well. I'm doing some work for them tomorrow, in fact. These systems are filled, in my view, 
with extraordinary people yes. who are utterly committed to what they're doing. But the systems are not just failing us, they're failing them. Yeah. So there are huge gaps in the NHS, aren't there? The recruitment gaps. There are huge gaps in education. They're 40% of teachers don't last more than the first five years. I know. And it's because the system fails them. You come into teaching because you love kids. You don't come there to earn lots of money. It's a daft place to go if you want to earn lots of money. You come in because you love kids and you want to see lives changed. You want to see young lives nurtured. You care about families. You care about them. And you get into a system where the regulation overwhelms you and the stupidity of some of it and the form filling and the tick box stuff, which means that you haven't got time to work with the families or the freedom to work with them in the way that you feel you should be able to work with them. And it just slowly, I see it time and time again, it grinds people into the dirt. One of our head teachers wrote to me, as I was writing my book. And she just told me about the fact that there was a young man who turned up in school dishevelled and lost and not well. So she took him home and found the whole family in that circumstance and went out to buy them provisions for the week. But she wrote to me and simply said, how long can I keep bearing this burden? Mm. I can't cope. Mm. It traumatises people in the system. So when my view is that when we say what we need is more investment and, we, you know, the, the, the system's broken, let's invest more and the politicians promise more money. I think like this, really, if you throw £100 down a toilet, you've lost £100. If you throw £10,000 down the same toilet, it's been a more expensive operation, but you've lost just as much. And it strikes me so often that the systems don't work and they don't work together and it, they're too much about form filling and tick, ticking this box and ticking that box. So they waste cash. And the other thing I think we do, and this sounds like I'm being extra negative about all of this, but I'm not. I'm passionate about these things. But I think that much of the money that goes in goes in to management because we got to management this case and that case so you're so busy managing cases and filling in forms on them but nobody's asking but whose life was transformed or changed i've got a really good friend who has been the leader of a council big council and i sat talking with them about six months before I started on this book. And we were talking about development work because Oasis works in other mm. countries as well. We were actually not talking about the UK. We were talking about India, mm. where we worked and where they visited. And I talked about development work and lifting people out of the slums and creating opportunity for them, et cetera, et cetera. And um, they said to me, there was a silence and they said, we don't really do development, do we? We do containment. We keep people. We look after people in their poverty. We try to nurse them along. But if you were asking me, they said, can I think of one family for whom the intergenerational poverty has been broken? Mm. I can't. That's not a lack of money, although investment, in my view, investment is always a wonderful thing. It's because of the systems are broken. Mm. The systems don't work together and the systems need a revolution. So when we came to COVID or to this cost of living crisis, well, if it was a football match, I love football. I'm a football fan. I support Crystal Palace football team, which is where I grew up. So I know about winning and losing. But it's like these families are 10 nil down before the game even starts. Nothing's working for them. Mm. It's a real, real uh, struggle for them. Uh, I've got a friend who's um, an architectural um, uh, professor. He, he lectures in architect. And he told me this story, which he says comes from Denmark. And he said that 
The town council in a particular Danish town were particularly worried about the residents of one of the housing estates on the edge of the town. And they were worried because they were unhealthy, obesity was a huge problem, people not eating correctly, people not exercising, etc., etc., all of this kind of thing. And the fact that nobody was using the leisure centre and the gym that was in the middle of the town. Mm. Uh, but it was built, he said, back in the 70s and it wasn't very attractive and it didn't say come in and it didn't say welcome. So the town council sat down and they thought, we've got to improve the ta- the health of the town generally and particularly this housing estate. So they employed some architects to think about a new design, perhaps a whole rebuild of the thing, but at least a new frontage mm. that was glass that said, come in, come in, you're welcome, etc. Uh, they employed a leading firm of architects who went away, did a huge amount of research on this. And then I've been to several meetings like this. You go and, and the architect reveals their designs and everybody's there for this PowerPoint presentation. And the first design came up, the first slide came up. And to everybody's shock, as the senior a practice lead architect revealed the first picture. It wasn't a design of a new leisure centre at all. It was a photograph of the bus timetable. And they said, you can pay us a fortune to redesign your leisure centre. But if you look at this bus timetable, I think you'll find a more obvious and cheaper solution to your problem. The buses don't run at the times when this community needs them. Often, we look in the wrong places yeah. uh, for the answers. Um, in my book, I talk about Sir Michael Marmot's report, yes. Fair Society, Healthy Lives, which came out in February 2010. And he talked about the inequalities and the growing inequalities. Mm. He talked about the fact that you know, those who were poorest, I think at that time, lived on average seven years less than those who were richest. And he said this was on the slide, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And he said, what you have to do is you have to re-empower communities, give them back the power over their lives, mm. listen to them. One of the things I say in another chapter of this book is, and probably said on one of these podcasts before or will say, is that we all believe in this great truth. It takes a village to raise a child. Mm. And you see that plastered on about every, in every council wall you ever walk, what office you ever go into. But we don't do it. We disempower the communities. We leave out the mums and the dads and the aunts and the uncles and the grandparents, the extended family. We don't listen to the people who, who've got street wisdom. We don't listen to the people who care about the community long before and long after any professional arrives or leaves. We don't engage people. So Marmot wrote this report and that's what he said was needed and no one listened. Mm. In 2020, he wrote another report 10 years on. By then, where I live in South London, now this is an NHS figure. The gap between the richest and their life expectancy and the poorest in the community where I live is now 17.4 years. And it's not just 17.4 years, it's that for a a longer percentage of their shorter lives, those who are poorest will live in ill health. Mm. And Marmot said again, the problem is the gaps got wider, but we've not asked local people what they want to do. We've not invited them back in. We've not built relationship with them, which I know is something you really strong on, isn't Hillary? Isn't it, Hillary? You understand that it, this is all relational in the end. And if you make it about policy and not relationships, it's never, ever, ever going to work. And the cost of this, Mama said, was some £40 billion a year to our economy. So even if we don't care about these social issues, it strikes me it's common economic sense to do something about this. The present government has a slogan that says, take back control. But actually, that's exactly what we need to do for local people. Give them back control of their communities by inviting them into the conversation 
and listening to them and working with them and empowering them. And I suppose, Hilary, you'd expect me to say that because my life has been about working in communities. Mm. The first community I ever really worked in was in Peckham, which is where I know you live. And I've learned that to do things without the people is always a mistake. We have to re-empower communities and we have to do it through relationship. Where there's a ruin, there's always hope if you learn the lessons. <laughs>